5-8802. Y eh, si pueden ver, el número va a aparecer en la pantalla. Gracias. Bonsoir tout le monde, non, moi c'est Aline, et je dis à moi-même avec collègue moins venante, avec MOB et um, Language Services, nous prenons bonne autre trans, um, traduction en créole pour grand conversation, ça qui pourrait le faire à soi. Um, si nous ne comprenons pas anglais ou bien nous avons préféré écouter conversation en créole, s'il vous plaît, nous allons camper pour nous aller dans la table de à côté interpréteur Yoshita pour nous apprendre un petit appareil comme ça. Um, si nous ne pas qu'à camper, si nous ne pas qu'à marcher, nous sommes trop contents pour nous porter pour nous, côté nous chita, juste lever mes nous pour nous capoter pour nous. Si nous avons regardé à ce la caïnou, à partir de la caïnou, nous avons en dans la ligne 305 901 26 92 pour nous attendre des traductions en créole pendant la conversation faite en direct. Merci beaucoup, enjoy. Ok, good evening everyone. Welcome to the Perez Art Museum Miami. My name is Marie Vickles, I'm the Director of Education. And I would like to thank you all for joining us tonight here at the museum and to those of you who are watching live on YouTube. Art in a post-row age with Antonia Wright and Maritza Lacayo. Uh, so for tonight, artist Antonia Wright and PAM Assistant Curator Maritza Lacayo will engage in a conversation about Antonia's newest digital work in artwork installation, Women in Labor. They will discuss how art can be used as a catalyst for conversation in a post-row age, the role of artists and curators when thinking about issues of reproductive freedom, the ways in which recent events will impact the art world and artist practices, and the power of storytelling to foster empathy and understanding. Before we begin our program, I would like to thank and acknowledge the incredible team of people that work to produce our PAM education programs. Big thank yous go out to Anita Bram, Associate Director of Adult and Public Programs, and our world-class audiovisual team, Denise Faxis, Andrew Bird, and Lazaro Yanis on video and camera. We literally could not do this without you all. Also, I want to acknowledge our many, many team members across a wide array of departments from marketing and communications to our security teams to the front um, desk, our VS services, so thank you. Okay, some introductions of our featured speakers. Maritza Lacayo is an assistant curator at the Perez Art Museum Miami. At PAM, she has organized numerous exhibition projects, including Polyphonic, celebrating PAM's fund for the African American art, the artist as a poet, Selections from Pam's Collection, Marco Brambilla, Heaven's Gate, Jed Novat, Monotypes and More, among others. Maritza has numerous exhibitions forthcoming, including Jason Sife, Coming to Fruition, and the co-organizing of Leandro Ehrlich Liminal. She has also managed the production of various publications and exhibition catalogs for Pam, including on the Horizon, Contemporary Cuban Art from the Jorge M. Perez Collection, Ebony G. Patterson, While the Dew is Still on the Roses, The Other Side of Now, Foresight in Contemporary Caribbean Art, and Beatriz Gonzalez, a retrospective named one of the New York, best ti New York Times Best Art Books of 2019 as well. She holds a BA in Art History from the American University of Paris and a Master of Letters in Modern and Contemporary Art and Art World Practices from the University of Glasgow, Scotland. Antonia Wright is a Cuban-American artist born right here in Miami, Florida. Antonia received her MFA in Poetry from the New School of New York and completed the General Studies Program at the International Center of Photography, New York. Through a multimedia practice of video, performance, photography, sound, light, and sculpture, she responds to extremes of emotion, control, and violence as it relates to the systems of power in society. Antonia often uses the human body as a principal element in her work. Select solo exhibitions include those at Spinello Projects, Locust Projects in Miami, Florida, Art Kiosk in Redwood City, NSU Art Museum in Fort Lauderdale, Luis de Jesus Gallery in Los Angeles, and the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art in Scottsdale, Arizona. Selected group exhibitions include those at the Frist Art Museum in Nashville, Tennessee, 
Contemporary Art Center in New Orleans, the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, DC, the Faina Arts Center in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and the Perez Art Museum, Miami. Antonia was recently named a 2021 Cintas Foundation Fellowship finalist and received the 2019. Antonia also serves on the board of Lotus House, Locust Projects, and Planned Parenthood Southeast and North Florida. I want to mention we will have a moment for questions at the end of the uh, discussion between Maritza and Antonia. So if you are joining us on YouTube, please post your questions in the comments section. And if you're joining us right here in the audience, just raise your hand and we'll come around with microphones. And we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Antonia Wright and Maritza Lacayo. Well, thank you. Thank you all so very much uh, for coming here tonight. This, um, this conversation stems from uh, a meeting and a conversation that we had just a couple weeks before Roe was overturned. And we bonded over the idea of having this conversation. And we wanted to use Pam and we wanted to use this platform as an opportunity to have this really important conversation to highlight Antonia's amazing work, Women in Labor, which we'll, which we'll talk about in detail, and also give people the opportunity to ask Antonia some questions and for us to just have a conversation about something that's so incredibly important. Um, the fact that there are so many of you here tonight uh, is proof that this is an important topic that we need to be discussing. So, you know, we just want to thank you for, for your attendance and for your support. Um, but yeah, we met a couple of weeks before Rose overturned and Antonia was mentioning to me that she was working on this amazing digital work called Women in Labor. And what struck me about it was that this is something that, which is typical of your practice, is that you're included in it, right? Your body is included in the work. Um, and that it's something that I think so many people are going to have a different experience from, right? Um, it's a work that's both um, an audio, there's an audio component, um, but when you showed it to me, I was able to kind of understand it from a visual perspective, right? Um, so we wanna share some of the audio with you guys as well, but before we do, Antonia, could you talk to us about what Women in Labor is, uh, what, what the title means to you and how you came to this idea, and of course, um, the, the medium itself? Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Maritza, for inviting me to speak here today. And thank you to, for the PAM to host this important conversation and everybody who worked with me. Um, and thank you for everyone for coming. Um, so Women in Labor is a generative sound art composition that uses data sonification to sonify the increase in mileage women will now have to travel by state to receive an abortion post Roe v. Wade. So I've worked with a midwife to collect the sounds that women make in labor, starting with my own home birth in 2015, which are the sounds used in the composition. Um, and, sorry, <laughs> I just have to breathe out a second. Um, so how it works is the midwife collects sounds that her clients make when they're in labor, and then she sends me the file, and then I edit the work into two, di two different categories, either intense, which are the more intense sounds women make in labor, usually during a contraction, or the softer sounds women make, which are usually the sounds between her contractions. Um, this is a data sonification. Artists often work in visual data visualizations. Um, so the data in this composition is what triggers what you hear and when you hear it. So I created an algorithm and programmed the code so that when a data point reaches a lower number in the composition, um, that's how far a woman would have to travel if, ro if abortion were legal. And if the data point reaches a higher number in the composition, that is the increase in mileage a woman will now have to travel, which will trigger a higher, more intense sound in the composition. Um, I obtained the data from the Guttmaster Institute. It's the leading uh, institute on abortion research. Um, so to give you an example, in the state of Florida, as of July 1st, 
abortion is now banned after 15 weeks. Before we had 24 weeks, a woman could get an abortion. But now after 15 weeks of labor, a woman has to travel 583 miles on average from Florida, and that's the equivalent to North Carolina to receive an abortion. Before, a woman on average could travel 13 miles. So now she can't travel after 15 weeks in pregnancy to anywhere in the South because there they have more restrictive laws actually than Florida. Right now in Florida, actually a lot of, and in, in the South, women are still coming to Florida to receive abortion care after 15 weeks because we're still considered a haven state for them. So in the composition, when 583 is selected, you will hear the really raw, intense, guttural sound of a woman in peak labor. And then if 13 is selected, then you'll hear the softer sounds. And those sounds sound like, um, sometimes they sound like breathing, they could sound like singing, sometimes they sound like love making. So when you listen to this composition, the data is constantly filtering through, and what you saw was the actual algorithm, which I created a max and coded. Um, and so the data is constantly filtering through, and it sounds like a call and response. So you'll hear like the softer sounds women make, and then the more intense sounds. And every once in a while, when the number hits over 600, the whole thing shuts down, and then you hear the raw, intense scream. Like women in Louisiana right now have to drive 660 miles to receive an abortion. So this is what the composition is working with. And, um, I chose the title uh, Women in Labor for a few reasons. It's actually women in labor is what we will be listening to. And I know that seems contradictory to talk about women having babies in the same conversation as abortion rights. But um, I wanted, I chose the work um, to work with the midwifery community specifically because midwives believe that women have a unique female power because we can give life. And midwives believe um, that birth can be very euphoric and they really offer a space for what I think autonomy looks like for the reproductive female body. And also, like in Florida, we have a 50% cesarean rate. So women go into the hospital system expecting a natural birth, and they leave with sometimes a very traumatic experience. Like the World Health Organization recommends that the average cesarean rate is like 10 to 15%. And I even heard in Miami it's 60%. So I think part of the conversation is not only being allowed to decide if and you decide, or if you have the choice to decide whether to have a child, but how to have it. And yes, midwives create the space for women to have like the paradigm of this autonomous female body. Also, women in labor is a play on words. Um, when you make abortion illegal, it really does not make it go away. It just makes it harder for women to access care. Now they'll have to drive farther distances, they'll have to take off time from work, they'll have to pay for hotels, they'll have to get childcare, et cetera. And then also, if you force a woman into having an unwanted pregnancy, she will have so much more work for the rest of her life. And this is financially, this is physically, this is emotionally. And if you force a woman to have a baby that she does not want to have, you take away her autonomy for the rest of her life. Also, there's the idea of women in labor um, in terms of invisible labor that women perform. There's a theorist, Silvia Federici. She writes a lot about this invisible labor that women do. She calls it cheap care. And men do it too, but oftentimes it's what women do, which is taking care of children. And this is all unpaid labor that women do. And then at the end of their lives, they tend to take care of their parents. And capitalism is completely predicated on this invisible cheap care that women provide. And if it weren't for this cheap care, there would be no capitalism. Also, Women in Labor talks about the, the wage uh, in pay between men and women in the workforce. So the issue, um, the title is very sort of concrete in a sense, but it's also very uh, abstract enough to think about the, woman, the work that women perform in their homes, in society, and then all of the extra work women will have to do by making abortion illegal. Yeah, and I mean, what's interesting about the title, too, is that I think depending on who you are and what your experience has been, you're going to interpret the title differently, right? So for me, initially, I thought work as in 
I thought labor as in work. I thought, how much more work does it take to access the care? But for someone else, it could be giving birth, right? So there's this idea that the title, I think, allows for everyone to reflect on this work uh, in, in a different way. So without further ado, let's listen to the audio. Let's give you guys a chance to hear and experience the work. <laughs> So that gives you an idea. <laughs> that was a minute and 30 seconds of the composition, and the work is generative. Uh, there's a lot of randomization in the composition. So once it plays, uh, it plays on a computer, and once it plays, it goes forever, and it will never sound the same way twice. All the data is constantly filtering through and triggering different compositions and different sounds. Right. I'm curious to hear why you chose this medium. And, and I wanted to comment and get your thoughts also on the fact that for me, this medium is very much also um, referring to the fact that we live in this moment of sort of mass digital surveillance. So was that something that you also had in mind as you were thinking of, of creating this work, or is that something that just happens to work? I know, it's scary, actually. Um, yeah, so I wanted to make a sound composition to use sound as a way to empathize with these women's voices. Um, the composition, um, and I also wanted to use women's voices specifically so that they could be heard and to also reflect their voices more authentically. Like the Hollywood ear con of what a woman sounds like in labor is very different from what women actually sound like in labor. It's very much a fictionalized portrayal of women's voices. And I think it's almost like the equivalent of the male gaze or a sonic gaze. And so I wanted to reflect what women actually sounded like, and they sound very powerful, and they sound vulnerable. Sometimes they sound sweet or funny, but they're also in pain, and you can hear the pain. And I think that opposition to abortion entails that a women suffer in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, I think the sounds are also very intimate. Like, a lot of times these are in the home, because it's a home birth, and it's just the midwife and maybe the, the woman's partner and her family. So the sounds are also very, very intimate, I think, to mirror how intimate the de per decision is itself, how personal that decision is for a woman. Yeah, and I mean, I think it also echoes the fact that this is something that isn't talked about often, right? It's something that we sort of treat as this private thing that, um, that some would even consider to be embarrassing or shameful to talk about. It's, I think that the moment that we open up the dialogue and that more women are able to have these conversations and hear this and know that this is very much a safe space for women, mm -hmm. then the conversation changes and we're able to own that conversation. And I think that the work does that, right? It doesn't shy away from what we normally shy away from. Instead, it opens it up. And I'm wondering if you felt that that was also the intention, if you were hoping that that message would come through and what you hope that message is for, um, you know, for, for, for different people who are going to experience this work. Yeah, absolutely. We tend not to talk about birth or miscarriage, which, right. you know, is a huge percentage of pregnancies or even abortion. All of these were very taboo issues. 
Um, and when I made this composition, I really wanted it to be like a sonic protest against these new laws. And I wanted it to kind of rally women, uh, to galvanize women and men who are pro-choice and who believe this. I also wanted to use this as a pedagogical opportunity to kind of give agency to men, to empower themselves to learn more about what women in labor is in this political climate with reversing Roe. Yeah, and that's something that I always annoyingly talk about is that we need more men as part of the conversation, that the more that we open up the conversation, the more allies that exist, uh, the more change can, can happen. So this is an action call to all of the men who are sitting <laughs> up in the audience today. Um, but I did wanna talk to you a little bit about your work outside of your artistic practice. So uh, as Marie mentioned in the introduction, you are on the board of Planned Parenthood as well. How has that informed your practice and how do you feel that it will continue to inform your practice as we see the consequences of the overturning of Roe uh, play out over the next couple of months, years, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. I've been on the board of Planned Parenthood for five years. Um, and I work with the organization in different ways. Like I just released this limited edition print to fundraise for Planned Parenthood. Uh, this is an image of broken glass using the cyanotype process. And the suffragettes actually broke storefront windows in their fight to gain the right to vote. And glass and feminist movements have a long history together. Um, the, femi the suffragettes were amazing. They were really good at PR. Like they always used to wear white because they knew that all the images were in black and white and it would make them more visible if they wore white. So they did this campaign where they broke windows around the city of London um, because they knew most of the stores were owned by men and um, yet they were the one buying the things in the store and they knew they had this sort of purchasing power. So they smashed the windows to get more attention and more, many of these tactics actually worked. So that's why um, we wanted to use, that's why I wanted to show this image sort of in this kind of very empowering way. Um, but yeah, that's very much a part of my practice. I think of it as my social practice, um, is this work that I do with Planned Parenthood. Um, actually, my mom, when I was younger, she used to take me to a lot of protests. Uh, we're Cuban, and anytime there was like any issue between Cuba and the, uh, the U.S. politically, my mom would take me to Calle Ocho to like protest as a kid. And I remember looking around and like seeing the adults and being like, what is happening to them? They were like screaming and they were all excited. And I was like, this is kind of amazing. And as I got older, I really started loving protests for that reason. I think that it kind of brings us out. There's a sense of community. It's different from feeling like really depressed at home and like watching the news by yourself. You know, you feel more empowered. And I think it really does cause you to kind of get more involved. Like I got involved in Planned Parenthood around the time of the Women's March in Washington. I was like, this is the time to do it. But I also work a lot with uh, the Lotus House and, you know, women with children are very, very vulnerable in our societies, and I see this work as being in tandem with that work as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I know it to be a big part of your practice, but I definitely wanted you to mention it. I, I'm curious to know um, what your message is to other artists, because that's another conversation that we want to have tonight, too, is the role that artists and curators and museums and institutions play um, in this post row world, right? And I think that having this conversation uh, is a good start. The fact that we're here, that we're at PAM, that we're using an institution as a platform to have this conversation is a good start. But I'm wondering if you have a message to artists who might feel like this is too difficult a topic to tackle. Um, I know that it's polarizing. We know it's polarizing. We know it's difficult. And we know that it's risky to have these conversations. You know, we're, we're well aware of that. And, and that's part of the reason why people don't want to have these conversations. But I think that art, what makes art important is that it provides people with a different point of view. It provides a catalyst for conversation. It allows for us to understand something in a different way, sometimes when words can't quite do the work. And so, what is your message to artists that maybe don't want to tackle this, this topic? I know. Um, yes, it's a very divisive issue, and we are operating in a binary where most people are on one side of this issue or the other. And when I did release this fundraiser for Planned Parenthood, I noticed on my social media that a ton of people stopped following me in like one day. 
it was just like, that's it, you know? And I was like, wow, you know? Um, so I can understand why you would be afraid to tackle this issue. Um, and it's hard to be inclusive when talking about these things yeah. too sometimes. Um, but at the same time, like I think that we'll, it's time will tell what kind of work comes out of this right now. Like because I've been working with Planned Parenthood for so like for a few years, we kind of knew this was coming. Um, like the second the Supreme Court took the case, we knew they were going to overturn it because they never would have taken this case if they weren't really thinking about overturning it. So the second that conversation started happening around Planned Parenthood, you know, like I stopped sleeping and started getting anxiety and like night sweats and I was like, ah, you know, and, um, and I've been kind of thinking about this for a long time because of that, which I think has allowed me this kind of space to think about, you know, how would I make a work, you know, in response to Roe. Um, but it also isn't a new issue. You know, I mean, these repo rights conversations have been happening for a long time, and women's rights issue have been having for a long time. And, you know, this is, in a way, just the beginning, yeah. reversing Roe. Yeah. But, um, so we'll see. I see, think artists have different ways of processing information. Some work a lot slower, which isn't bad. It's just, um, and maybe, too, to your question, like artists that might feel afraid, but then what if, like, they start experiencing it personally? Like, because right. I've already been hearing friends who were pregnant and then have a miscarriage and they go to the hospital and now they're not allowed to do the procedure to remove the fetus from their body. Right. So that's, I imagine, will anger a lot of artists, which a lot of time art comes from anger. So we'll see what that looks like. Yeah, the, the, the revolutionary power of women's anger, right? It's, it's, it's angry women that very oftentimes uh, create progress through that anger. I, I think that for curators as well, it's also, it's also difficult because nine times out of 10, I mean, unless you're an independent curator, you're working on behalf of an institution, right? You're working like me. I'm here tonight as Maritza Lacayo, but I'm here first and foremost as assistant curator of PAM. And so we have to think about our role in this larger, in this greater art world and think about how we can use our platforms to do good, but without creating a divisive or difficult environment because ultimately we want everyone to feel welcome mm -hmm. and we want everyone to have the conversation. So it's a really, really, really tricky balance. Sure. So I get it and I just think that the fact that we're having this conversation today is a good start and I'm, what I'm hoping is that other institutions, that other commercial galleries, that other artists start to feel more comfortable having this conversation because it's just the beginning, which means that for many the fight is just beginning. But it also means that there haven't been really all that many examples for some people right. who might not be paying a lot of attention um, in terms of the consequences of overturning Roe, right? Uh, some of us are reading about these things every day mm -hmm. uh, and some people kind of get a few bits and pieces of that kind of news. And so I think it's important for us to, to keep that in mind as well, that as the weeks go by, as the months go by, and we start to see the consequences of this action that I think people will be forced to respond in some way or at the very least participate in a conversation. Um, what do you think the artist's role is um, within this conversation? I mean, not just those who maybe are afraid or aren't afraid, but I think that artists do play a very particular and strong role in society. How do you think that, um, how do you think that that role is gonna play out with this particular topic? Um. I don't know, I mean, it's sort of hard to say, but I do think that through art, we can kind of maybe get away with more things than yes. say an institution can. That's a fact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see as well how, how it's evolved, but I think the conversation has already evolved. Like when I was working on this composition for the last year, I was having studio visits and playing the work and people would say to me like, they'll never reverse row. And I was like, no, no, they will, and they are, and it's gonna happen, and that this is anticipating that. And now when I play the conversation, it seems like everybody is on the same page. Like, the, I've noticed the level of discourse is so much higher now than it used to be. Like, people have been reading a lot about this issue, actually. Yeah, yeah I mean, for, for a lot of people, it wasn't a question of whether it would or wouldn't be to overturn, it was a question of when. Mm -hmm. And so my response to a lot of people who would say, oh my God, I'm so shocked, I can't believe this is happening, I would kindly, or I would think I kindly said, you know, where have you, 
where have you been? You know, this is something that we sort of saw coming from miles and miles away. And as you said, it's not a new conversation, right? And when you think of Barbara Kruger and you think, you know, your body is a battleground, you know, this has been a conversation that's been ongoing for so long. But I did want to talk about some of the main differences between the post-row world that we're living in now and the pre-row world, right? And um, there are plenty of people who will remember pre-Roe, and we know that many, many women died of sepsis, internal injuries, all these other things. But for me, the main difference with the post-Roe, and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this, is there are two things that kind of come to mind. The first is access to medication abortion, which is a new thing, uh, definitely didn't exist before 1973, so that's something that allows for women to terminate a pregnancy in the privacy of their own home, right? So that's a huge development. The other one is the digital mass surveillance that we discuss, right? We're living in this moment where people are afraid to send messages to each other or have conversations about this in the digital realm because you can be criminalized or prosecuted and we're already seeing it happen. Um, there was that case a couple weeks ago, I think it was in Nebraska where uh, the authorities had uh, fa Facebook messages, right, between a, a daughter and her mother and they're being prosecuted because they have all these Facebook Messenger messages. And so I wanted to talk about that because when you think about medication abortion, it means that there's no longer a place to protest. There isn't a physical space. You're not going to a clinic, so you can't pick it outside, right? It's a very, very different way of handling the issue. So. I know that you created a work that we were actually able to show here at PAM. And not until we were having a, a kind of casual conversation in preparation for this conversation did you mention to me where the inspiration for this came from and we thought, okay, we definitely need to talk about this because it touches on that. Um, yeah, could you talk to us about this work and how it's related to this, to this conversation? Because I think when people look at this, they don't, they're not gonna see the connection right away, right? Sure, so I was at a, in a Planned Parenthood board meeting and Planned Parenthood was about to, talk, to open a new facility and they were talking about the facility and they were talking a lot about the entranceway because the entranceway to Planned Parenthood facilities is, can be a very hostile environment, you know, where women get harassed, where doctors get yelled at, it can be very unsafe for patients to enter. So Planned Parenthood, we used to rent facilities up until the point where the landlords would tell us, oh yeah, you can rent from me, however, you can't perform abortions in the facility. So like they would take our money, but then they would put restrictions on what kind of care we would offer. So then Planned Parenthood actually ended up starting to buy their own facilities. And so when they do th buy these facilities, they think about what kind of access they have into them. And in one of the meetings, um, somebody said, and this facility is great because it doesn't have a sidewalk. So nobody can protest. And I said, wait, what? And then they're like, yeah, if there's no sidewalk, it's actually illegal to protest. And I said, wow, that's so interesting, because I, you know, I love protest, yeah. and I was thinking <laughs> about, you know, the materiality of protest, and I was like, oh, right, like, that's what is the foundation for this. And then I started thinking at this time, uh, our country sort of erupted into this anti-immigrant rhetoric and became very nationalist and started talking about building this wall between the U.S. and Mexico. And I started thinking like, well, who's gonna build this wall? I was like, it's the same people dying trying to cross this wall. And I was like, who's building that sidewalk? It's the same people they're trying to kick off that sidewalk. Like who's building our homes? And again, talking about labor, it's all of this invisible labor that's literally pouring into the foundation of our society. And so I wanted to create this piece. Um, so now I'm the owner of a concrete mixer truck. <laughs> and um, the piece is converted into a musical instrument that plays the song Young, Latin, and Proud by the musician Elado Negro. So the piece really celebrates all of this work um, that immigrants do, but it also protests against all of this anti-immigrant rhetoric. And, but then again, it, Thinking about the work now, post row, um, yes, like when they say, you know, making abortion illegal only makes it unsafe, that's sort of true nowadays. Really, what it does is it criminalizes it, like you said. And then 
it also, it's now women aren't going back to like the hangar per se. What they are gonna do is just get pills, usually from the black market, often alone, which isn't healthy either, but that's sort of what the, the, like the landscape looks like. But it is a lot of anti-choices, people's like worst nightmare because there is no more front line. Like now women do not have to walk into that clinic anymore. So like that sidewalk and this whole conversation is sort of different, which I think goes into your com your question earlier, like what is art now? And I think it's sort of now to me about kind of looking at work that I made before and then thinking about it in the context of what it is now. Like I never thought about this in the context of abortion pills before. And now I'm like, of course it's about that too. You know, and then there's another video, um, maybe we can play the one with my face. With the glass, please. Oh, we can. We should. Oh, sorry. You should listen to this too, because it, it is an instrument. definitely gives you a sense of how, how the piece was, but I love what you said about how you're going back and you're looking at work that you've made now from a completely different perspective given the moment that we're in, and I think that that's true of art in general, right? I, 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 that's what I've been trying to do, and I'm sort of challenging myself to do that even here at PAM with the permanent collection. Like, how can I look at these works and think about what's going on? How can I recontextualize these works given what we're experiencing? And you can even do it from the most personal perspective, right? Like, as a woman, I'm gonna look at it differently, you know? And as a child of immigrants, I'm gonna look at it differently, right? And so I, I think that that's part of the reason why these conversations are also so important, because they give people the tools, I would hope that they give people the tools to look at something and give it an entirely new interpretation or just come to it from a different point of view so that we can reflect on what's happening now. Art is a reflection of both when it was made and also when you're seeing it and where it's located, whether you're seeing it in a white cube space, you're seeing it here at PAM on our concrete walls, or you're seeing it in a group show in conversation with other artists, right? So you have the opportunity to kind of recontextualize art over and over and over again. That's its strength, and I think it's a reflection of who we are too, right? If we are able to do that, if we are able to recontextualize things, if we are able to do that for ourselves over and over again, we never stop learning and we never stop empathizing. And I think that that was really my main purpose for wanting to have this conversation with you today because I think that art is also something that creates empathy, right? Storytelling provides a platform for you to see someone in a different way, for you to see what you have in common with them before what you you know, have different or, 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 or the things that make you um, perhaps disagree. And so that's one way to kind of think about not only your practice, which um, we're gonna look at a couple of other works here too, but I'm thinking also of um, just general tools for people to take with them in terms of interpreting art. But going back to your practice, uh, you use your body a lot within your work. And I think that when I think of your practice, that's usually what comes to mind. I obviously always think of the work that we included in On the Horizon, which opened the show, um, because you're in it, right? You're submerged in the pool, you're screaming in the pool. Um, and so I'm just, you know, I, I would like to kind of have a moment to reflect on this work that in a way also references break, we break through, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is a work too that I've been thinking about now. Um, now post row a lot actually, because yes, I made this work originally thinking about glass and feminist movements, but also thinking of this metaphor of you know breaking the glass ceiling, which was always this idea that is very popular in feminist movements. But then recently I saw Angela Davis give a talk and she was saying that actually breaking the glass ceiling is a very flawed metaphor because it implies that they're only that you have to be close to the top 
to break it. And so many women are nowhere near that glass ceiling. So it applies a tremendous sense of privilege and maybe even financial um, security that a lot of women don't have. And then she also talks about like women of color, lower income women and trans women that are nowhere near that glass ceiling. So I was thinking about that now looking at this and how it's as Gloria Steinman says, it's not equality, it's parity. It's equality, you know, in race, class, gender, and socioeconomic ways. Right, and the way that all those things are connected, and that's that's something else, right? When you're when we're thinking about issues of abortion, as you mentioned at the beginning, it's not necessarily just bodily autonomy. It's also an economic issue, right? We're thinking we have to think about this from many, many, many different perspectives, and that's how you get the message across. I, I recently read an article about climate change and the way that we communicate about climate change and that there have been all these studies done as to how you can have a more effective conversation about climate change and that when you talk about the polar bears and the Arctic, yes, it's sad and it's hard, but it feels far away, right? It doesn't feel like it's going to impact your everyday life. And so mm -hmm. essentially to make a very long article short, um, what they said is that if you replace the term climate change with pollution, then it becomes something that you can understand, right? You, it's something that you know how it feels to breathe in dirty air and you can envision it and you can feel it and it becomes this visceral kind of thought. And I think that that's the case with abortion as well, right? It needs to be talked about in a way of not just, oh, it's women over there, you know, women over there are gonna be affected by this, but everyone can be and will be um, affected by this. So that's another way um, I think that this needs to be talked about. Yeah, I mean, one in three women, people say, one in four women have had an abortion. So I think now people aren't as you know embarrassed to talk about it or feel as much shame to talk about it. Like I've been hearing about protests where women go in public and tell their abortion stories. And I think that can be a very cathartic experience for women. Mm -hmm. I do kind of have a problem with when I see um, like women forced to tell their abortion story in a way that's traumatic. Yeah. Like on the Senate floor, it's always like a woman pleading with somebody why she's like worthy to have made that decision about her own body. And I don't think that that seems right to me. And I think it only causes the woman like more trauma in the end, actually, to have to relive it from that perspective. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that we're now talking about more like these things a little bit more openly, more empoweringly. I also think we should start talking to women who lived with, um, who had abortions pre-1973 and learn from them and hear what they're saying now. Yeah, and the, the women pleading uh, in front of a group of either the Senate or whoever it may be, it also stems right back to before 1973 when women in hospitals had to petition in front oh. of an all-male panel of doctors to try and convince them that they were worthy of this procedure. So there's this long history of women being, I think, forced, as you said, to, um, to tell a story that they might not want to tell. And so I'm in favor of people sharing their stories if it's an empowering thing and it humanizes the experience, but we can't be in favor of forcing women to have these conversations or to tell these stories for the sake of progress. That feels ice cold and, and horrific, frankly, right? Yeah, the optics of the Senate floor reminds me of that. When women had to go before like an all-male panel and talk about why emotionally this would harm them or physically it would harm them. Right. And also it reminds me of like sing for your supper or something, you know? It's like, yeah, it's just, it's, it's more trauma to the woman, I think. And we have another example of a work that you've been revisiting, um, thinking about it from this new context. This is Are You Okay? Uh, should we play the clip first? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we can. This is an ongoing project that I've been working on for over 10 years, where I go into the street and cry and then capture how people do or do not ask me if I'm okay. And I started this project when I lived in New York City, and I always wear the same outfit and position the camera in similar ways, always hiding it. 
And in this particular case, I, this is the corner where I first made the first video of this project in 2009. And then I revisited the same spot as a pregnant woman to see if the reaction would be different to me than it was before. Part of the reason I make this work is very much about empathy. You know, I read the newspaper and then I realize that that's not really being so connected to what's happening after a while. It's like the facts and the data just kind of start like wearing off on you. And so what I do is I'll go into the street and cry and think about something that I read in the newspaper as a way to really empathize with something that I read on a personal level. But I wonder nowadays, and maybe you can tell me what you think, but like what this image of a crying pregnant woman, you know, post row is like. It's like a different image than it used to be before. Yeah, like what, what's the assumption that people would make in that, in that particular moment? So it did change then. More people approached you. Oh, or, yeah. yeah, men started approaching me. They're not in this particular part of the clip. When I did this project, I've done it in several different cities over the course of 12 years, and mostly only women have ever stopped to ask me if I'm okay. In New York City, prior to being pregnant, only women ever, ever have asked me if I'm okay. And then all of a sudden, I do this pregnant, and all these men started coming up to me and asking me if I was okay. Men with their sons, giving me hugs, giving me Kleenexes, and I was like, it triggered like a completely different response, which I thought was so fascinating. Yeah, I mean, there's this, there's this reverence, right, of, of pregnant women in our society, and as, as it should be, but then there's also this kind of irony to it, which is, you know, does the care continue after you've given birth, right? That's something that we also have talked about many times, <laughs> the two of us. Um, I'm wondering if we want to open it up to questions already. Yes, let's do it. Please raise your hand for a mic so everybody can hear, and we'll bring you a mic. Don't be shy. Shy crowd, yeah. Okay. okay. One second. Hi, how are you? Um, I was wondering what you tell people when they ask you what's wrong in the, in the piece. Right, I know, I'm actually a terrible actress. Um, so I really, really think about things very deeply to get to that place. So in this particular case, I mean, it's always very, very sad. And um, they were, it was just like in the height of the Syrian war. And I was reading that a lot of children were dying in Syria. And I just imagined what it would be like to be a mother and how much fear you would have and how sad and scary that would be and just trying to empathize with it from that perspective. But I, yeah, it always like catches me off guard because I kind of forget that I'm doing it. And sometimes I'm like, the world is sad. <laughs> and, like, and then people sometimes say back to me, yeah, it is, totally. And I'm like, thank you. And then, you know. Thank you. First of all, thank you to both of you and love your work. Um, so my question has to do with um, the first piece, Women in Labor. And you've talked about your decision to make it sonic, but I'm wondering if you could say something about your decision to not have it be visual, right? Because I mean, there's something so different about that. And obviously, even in other works where you've had compositions and you know auditory elements, the visual has still had a key role to play. So in this particular instance, what does it mean for you to not show? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dyack. Um, so yeah, this is just a sound composition, just with women's voices. That's really what I wanted to use and focus on. And actually, I'm having a show at Spinello Projects on September 24th, we'll, where we will be installing a multi-channel sound installation. And when you walk into that room, there'll actually be no light on whatsoever. So you'll be in the dark, 
listening to the composition, which I think will make it kind of, you feel even more vulnerable. Like darkness can make you feel very kind of lonely and scared almost. But also when you isolate the senses, you can hear better. So by removing the visual, I think it's easier for us to hear. Brilliant. Okay. Um, I, this is just an observation. I, I just found it really, um, I guess, affirming and warming to my heart to see that the two women that spoke to you first in that clip that you showed when you're crying in the street are um, black women, you know? And I think black women take a lot of the labor of this country and, and beyond, like on their shoulders. So I thought that was very telling you know, in, in many ways. And I don't know, can you speak more about the, um, I guess the intersectionality part, you know, because when we think about women's marches, we think a lot about the protests that have happened within the past, you know, like five to 10 years around this issue. A lot of times the voices that we see at the forefront are primarily women, privileged white women, et cetera. So like, how do you ensure like your art is reaching like a wider, you know, audience. Yeah, absolutely. And also reversing Roe will mostly affect women of color. Exactly. And poor women. And that's one of the reasons too why I wanted to use the midwifery community because the hospital system can be so hostile to women of color and specifically black women. Like black women, I'm sure you know this, have a high infant mortality rate, a high, higher, way higher mortality, maternal mortality rate. And a lot of this, and just healthcare in general for black women is so much worse. I think it's really indicative of a bigger problem all around, you know, that there's not enough education and, you know, there's a million reasons why um, the access isn't there. So um, I think that's a really good question. I mean, I know Planned Parenthood serves a lot of women of color uh, and their staff is a lot of women of color. Um, one of my ideas for this composition actually was to, um, embed it in Planned Parenthood's protest bus. Planned Parenthood has a protest bus um, that they use to travel around the country, but also, and it's become more popular now with the pandemic, but also in Florida and in other states, they have started passing anti, what they call are anti-riot bills, which are really anti-protest bills. Um, so in order to kind of subvert these new laws, um, we have this protest bus that we use as a way to kind of subvert the protest laws. And I was thinking about embedding it with a speaker that would play the composition. So it would be a kind of sonic activism to play it to people on the street and to go to different demographics areas and see the response to it. So make it mobile and like take it out of the art context, which I know tends to be, um, less diverse at times. But if you have any ideas, I would love to hear them, please. Hi, um, I, I wanna ask from both of your vantage points, what are the things that we should be on the lookout for? You know, I, you mentioned, um, you know, from being a board member at Planned Parenthood, you know, the moment that certain people got confirmed on the Supreme Court, the moment that they took up that case, you knew it was a done deal, right? So is there a way that you can share what you know about what scarily might be coming down the pipeline so that we know what's, what's around the corner? And, and, I, and I asked both of you that question so that from these institutions and from the world that is contemporary art, how can we be proactive about these things as opposed to reactive? Um, and just, I just want to share an anecdote. Um, when um, abortion was made illegal in Romania, um, 21 years to the day, uh, the dictator that made it illegal fell. Um, now, correlation or causation, that's up for debate. But again, just to sort of forecast the future, what, what could be the long-term consequences of this um, in our society, in art, um, and in general? Thank you. 
I mean, it's so still in flux. Like in Florida, the 15-week abortion ban is now in place, but a judge has blocked it, and then Planned Parenthood sued, and then a judge blocked it again. In Louisiana, I mean, that one I screenshot every time I get a New York Times alert that that one's been overturned and turned and overturned and turned. I mean, right now, all of the states are totally in flux and banning things and changing the laws. You know, it's like really hard for me because with the data sonification, at one point I was changing all the data like every day. And I was like, this is just insane, you know, what's happening right now. Um, but yeah. yeah, it's definitely a platform is to chip away little by little at all our abortion rights. Yeah, and I mean, this is something that I, that I preach and I sound like a broken record, but vote, please, for the love of God, <laughs> you know, vote. Because what happens is that when one state passes a clever bill, then there are a whole bunch of other states that will copy that bill because they see that it was effective, that they were able to kind of circumvent uh, the conventional laws or the, or the conventional ways of, of, of passing trap laws. Um, trap laws being a targeted regulation against abortion providers. So when you see one state do something, beware of the fact that it'll soon happen somewhere else. And one of the ways that we can deter that uh, is, 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 is by making your voice heard in, in the ballot box, right? I always encourage people to, uh, to volunteer, but most importantly, just show up, just vote. Talk to your friends, talk to your family about voting, register the people around you to vote, because as, and I know how annoying that sounds, because we vote, and then sometimes things don't go our way anyway, and that can be incredibly demoralizing and horrific, and sometimes even feels worse <laughs> than not being involved at all. But I think that you know, river, uh, what is it, water cuts through rock, not through strength, but persistence. And so we need to continue to do that by never allowing the frustration that we feel against the system win. We need to continue to participate. This is the system that we have, it's not perfect. And I could sit here all night and tell you about how I don't think it's perfect, but if it's a system that we have, it's the system that we have to work with and change it as we go. So that would be my number one piece of advice probably. Also be safe. Like if you know any women who want to get abortions, tell them to be very, very, very vigilant with their digital footprint and their social media and their emails and their phone calls and their Google searches. All of that can be considered evidence if a woman is criminalized for abortion. If she travels out of state, all of those rules are changing right now too, where they're criminalizing women for traveling out of state, and that's a huge topic right now. So just please tell women to be safe um, so that that evidence cannot be used against them. Like their ride shares, all of that can be included as evidence. And then also I would just say like show up. Right now, the house is on fire, and we're all here, and we're all safe, but there's still people in the house, and we can run back in there, and we can try to save them. And I know it's scary, and I know it's hard, but I just tell myself that all the time. You know, courage is not acting without fear, it's acting with fear anyways. So I just think, you know, call abortion funds, volunteer, um, you know, register as a poll worker, all these things that are great ways to show up right now. I have a question. Um, you talked about a bit about like how polarizing this issue is as a whole, and I find myself, you know, very frustrated with most conversations that I have with anybody who's on the opposing side. Have you had any success with your, any of your works in changing anyone's mind? I mean, that's hard to say. Um, I think of art sometimes as like a portal into people where it's like, I mean, I'm not gonna systemically change anything maybe right now, hopefully, maybe in like a very kind of imagined future, but um, it's like you reach one person and then you hope they tell their children like a different message. I think that's how you sort of change these systemic ideas. Slow, yeah. And I yeah. think by asking questions too, you know, clarifying if someone has a different opinion, um, you know, wh wh where did you learn that? What do you mean by that? And then you have a conversation from their perspective, from their side, and it allows even for you to learn about where some of that, uh, where some of those opinions came from. So asking questions and trying to kind of reach across to understand where their point of view came from can also help you have a better conversation. I think that one of the things that we do very poorly now in our society is that we listen to respond. We don't listen to understand. 
we live in a very sort of reactive society. And so the more that we can pause and actually try and understand what the other person is saying, even if it sounds appalling to us, <laughs> is giving that a chance um, so that we can maybe respond in a slightly more empathetic or compassionate way. Yeah, I think that is how you change people's opinions sometimes. It's like you just, in nonviolence resistance movements, one of the tactics that they use is if you're in a conversation with somebody, and in our society we very much have this metaphor of argument as war, where you want to win the argument, and how you do that is with more facts, and you kind of outsmart them. But in nonviolence resistance movements, they say if somebody says something to you that you know maybe is in opposition to your opinion, what you do is you repeat it back to them, and you just kind of start to clarify what it is that they're trying to say. And then maybe that person the next day will be like, is that what I really believe? You know, so you don't really challenge them. Well, you do in a way, but that kind of changes the narrative of what they expect you're going to do. Because if you just play in to the normal back and forth banter on this issue, you're really not, we're not going to get anywhere. But if you kind of change what they expect from you, then perhaps you might get a different response. Um, one question here. You mentioned the fine line that museums and institutions have to play on these issues that can be very polarizing. What do you think the long-term cost is to institutions that try to remain neutral during these times? I think the cost is huge. I think it's enormous. I don't think that we can afford it. That's my honest opinion. That's why I was so proactive about having this conversation. Because I think that when you remain, this is something that is said very often, but when you remain silent in times of oppression, you side with the oppressor. Uh, if you're not lending your voice to what you believe in and you're silent, then you're complicit. And so I think that institutions have to think about how they want to be perceived. You know, are we on the right side of history? Are we not on the right side of history? How did we participate? How did we react? Did we provide a safe place for people to have this conversation? And if we don't do that, I think the cost is really, really, really huge because we lose our, um, our, our credibility. Because what we're supposed to be, what our mission is, is to provide a space for using art as catalyst for a conversation where everyone can feel welcome and everyone can feel safe. And I think that the moment that we deviate from that, people won't see us as an important part of the community. And here at PAM, we aim to be that. I always try and describe PAM as like, the front porch of Miami. I want everyone to feel comfortable here. I want everyone, people who don't have a background at all in modern and contemporary art should come here and still enjoy it or dislike it, I don't care. But I want it to belong to them as much as it belongs to me. And the only way that we do that is by providing um, a platform that feels safe for everyone. So again, I, I, th I think it's something that we can't afford to do and I, hope that this conversation today is the start of many more conversations and of us being able to continue um, thinking of Pam as, as a platform that is on the right side of, of history. Seems like the perfect note to end on. So thank you so much, Antonia and Maritza, for this really terrific conversation. Thank you all for coming.